Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Cotton Grower Magazine's Cotton Companion Podcast. This is Jim Stedman, editor of Cotton Grower, and with me to help wrap up another year of visits with you is my colleague and good friend, Beck Barnes. Now, Beck, we've been producing this podcast now for, what, seven years? Seven years. Seven years. It's amazing how fast that time's gone, you know, as as we sit here at the, the end of 2023. Yeah, yeah, it has flown by. It doesn't seem like it's been seven years, but yeah, we started doing this back when, back in the pre, uh, PP, pre-pandemic, when we had a real brick and mortar office. And I, you know, I was thinking about that uh, recently. You know, when we started, boy, we we looked the part. We had the the headphones and the microphone with the little screen over the mic, and uh, yep. Well, we had outfitted. Remember, I know you do because you you did the heavy work there. We'd outfitted that office with um, what do you call that egg crate foam? Yeah, we tried to soundproof it as best we could. Just Sound, soundproof. Well, we back then we shared a wall in our office park here in Memphis, uh, just for everyone's uh, inside info. Yeah, we shared a wall with a dentist, and so we would get going, and suddenly the drill would start up over there, and occasionally you'd hear. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Or somebody or, getting a root canal or, or something. Or laughter from the, uh, you know, from the, you know, from the laughing gas. Yeah. So it was, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. So we were much more uh, on top of trying to control the, the sound back then. And now I, I think it's a reflection. I think software has just improved to the yeah. point that we don't really have any of that goofy stuff, uh, mics or, or earphones anymore. We just do it like a regular old video conference call video conference call yeah because face it when we started this thing we had absolutely no idea what we were doing 100 <laughs> percent clueless kind of still 100 percent clueless <laughs> uh just with seven years of, of kind of somewhat learning involved yeah well you know I'd, I'd like to think within seven years we've we've improved the product just a little bit but anyway as we're wrapping up this year uh obviously we're also wrapping up the 2023 harvest season uh, and from what i hear in the industry uh, ginning in some areas may be wrapping up soon as well. So that means meeting season is getting ready to kick off for the cotton industry. And that starts with the annual Beltwide Cotton Conferences, the first week of January in Fort Worth, Texas. And that's followed pretty quickly, if you look at the calendar, by a host of state and regional meetings throughout January and February, including the National Cotton Council's annual meeting in mid-February, we're going to be present at several of these upcoming events, and we certainly look forward to uh, to seeing you there. Now, Beck, I'm sure, speaking of anticipation, I'm sure there's a certain amount of anticipation around your house right now for the Christmas holidays. Yeah, you know, you could call it that. We, uh, As we record here, it's the, tw- it's the 18th, so we're a week away from the big day from Christmas. And uh, yeah, we actually, my toddler went and sat on Santa's lap. At a little neighborhood Christmas gathering last night, and uh, she she's two now. She asked Santa what he wanted for Christmas, so we got it. We <laughs> got a it generous, a little bit backwards. He's a generous child. Yeah, yeah. Well, she'll um, you know, maybe probably this time next year she'll have it fully figured out. But yeah, we're still a little little fuzzy on the details this year. Well, that's that's good. Well, speaking of anticipation, I think pretty much everybody in the industry is looking forward to uh, starting to look ahead, at least to the twenty twenty four season. Uh, they're busy getting their plans in place um, uh, for, for both production and prob- probably for marketing at this point, which I think is going to be a really important issue for next year. I recently had a chance to sit down with Dr. Darren Hudson from Texas Tech University to visit about some of his thoughts and predictions for cotton in the new year and maybe some hints on what growers need to be thinking about right now in terms of their production and marketing plans. Now, Darren, as I've, as I've told him several times, has the world's longest title. He's the Combest Endowed Chair, Director of the International Center of Agricultural Competitiveness, and Interim Associate Dean of Research at Texas Tech University. I think he, if, if, if that's all on a business card, I think it's one that folds down several times uh, when you bring it out. But anyway, he's a, uh, he's a sought after source of economic information for the cotton industry and in Washington, D.C. as well as an advisor to the Senate and House Agriculture Committees. Uh, He's informative, he can be pretty entertaining, and we're going to have that interview for you here in just a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that, Jim. But first, we want to hear our sponsor partner, the American Cotton Shippers Association. They got a brief message they'd like to share. The American Cotton Shippers Association, also known as AXA, is a trade association primarily made up of cotton merchants founded in 1924. 
AXA members manage the majority of the world's cotton trade, providing services of merchandising, delivery logistics, and risk management to their customers. AXA is proud to be celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Join them in Scottsdale, Arizona in June 2024 for their centennial celebration event. Okay, big thanks to our friends at AXA for that message and for their support. Okay, now uh, we're talking about planning for next year's crop. It is that time of year when new cotton variety, seed variety announcements are being made. And Delta Pine has always kicked off announcement season during their recent Delta Pine NPE Summit, which was followed a few days later by some new variety info from the good folks at Phytogen. So uh, Delta Pine up first, we have two new varieties that will make up Delta Pine's class of 24, both containing the B3 TXF trait. Jim, help me, that's Bolgard 3 Thrive On Extend Flex, right? That's correct. There we go, I'm proud of myself. Trait protection. Uh, these varieties were selected based on evaluation of eight variety candidates by the NPE or new product evaluator growers during the 2023 season. So the first is DP2436 NR, that's nematode resistant, B3 TXF. It is a mid-maturity cotton variety for the central to southern Texas high, high plains. It's got resistance to root knot nematode and bacterial blight. It demonstrated strong performance in West Texas, showing yield potential on par with DP1820, B3XF. And this new variety delivered outstanding fiber quality in NPE plots and has moderate tolerance to verticillium wilt. So there you go. Second here that they are introducing is going to be DP2414, B3TXF. This is an earlier maturing cotton variety that responded well to high yield environments and showed yield potential and fiber quality on par with both DP2115 B3XF and DP2211 B3PXF. Now, this variety fits the early season regions of the Mid-South and Southeast and in irrigated fields in the Northern High Plains of Texas. So that's kind of a broad footprint there. So go ahead, 2414. Okay, Phytogen is also offering us two new varieties for next year. These have proven high yield potential in key cotton growing regions, cotton growing regions for 2024. Okay, first up is Phytogen 137W3E1. This is an early to mid maturing variety for the Southwest cotton belt with built in genetic resistance to root knot nematodes and bacterial blight. Features the Widestrike 3 E1 trait package that combines the enlist cotton trait with Widestrike 3 insect protection. Giving cotton producers the choice to customize their, weed, customize their weed management program and to save on some input costs if they do not need that glyphosate tolerant trait. And then the second one from Phytogen is Phytogen 475W3FE. Now, this one is a mid to full season variety, fits the agronomic needs of the Southeast, especially in Georgia. It's an easy to manage variety with resistance to root knot and reniform, reniform nematodes, as well as bacterial blight. That W3FE trait package offers growers the option to control weeds with over-the-top applications of Enlist herbicides, glufosinate, and glyphosate, of course. So you can find more information about all of these new Delta Pine and Phytogen varieties online at cottongrower.com. That's great. Well, thanks, Beck. Now let's hear from Dr. Darren Hudson. We're visiting today with, uh, with Dr. Darren Hudson. He's the Combest Endowed Chair and Davis College Interim Associate Dean for Research at Texas Tech, still the world's longest title yes. for an individual. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, Darren, we've uh, we've talked before. Hmm? We've you've been on the podcast. We've doing uh, talk quite frequently yep. on the phone. But anyway, welcome back well, to thanks. the Cotton Companion. Thanks, having a, glad to be on. Okay. Uh, we have now wrapped up the 23 crop, mm -hmm. even though USDA may still say there's a small percentage it has to be harvested, mm -hmm. but regardless, where is the farm sector sitting right now in terms of like input costs, debt, things like that heading into 24? I think if you look at um, sort of the level of input costs, right, we're, we're flat. Um, I think, um, you know, fertilizers have come down a bit. Some of the other things have gone up a little bit. This is offset. It's pretty, pretty flat uh, for the last year. 
Um, and going into 24, sort of the expectations may be flat to off, you know, coming off a little bit in terms of, uh, but we're still at, you know, 30 to 40 percent higher than we were two years ago. So um, e even though that helps uh, in terms of the, um, the overall profitability, um, it, it's still um, at a very much elevated level relative to the prices that, that farmers are receiving at this point. Mm -hmm. and I don't think that's going to change in, in 24 much, although the prices have come up a little bit in the last couple of days, and hopefully they'll, they'll hold in there. Um, but, you know, we're still looking at probably, you know, a solid, you know, 76, 77 cent um, type of total cost production nationally. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, trading at 77, 78 cents on the futures market minus basis signal to cut it, uh, at least on the total cost basis. So, you know, I think what a lot of producers are going to be looking at going into the 24 year, unless, you know, unless the relative prices change a lot over the next couple of months is which, which one's probably going to lose them the least, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, at least on a total cost basis. So I think they're, um, you know, cotton actually looks decent in that mix, mm -hmm. uh, but it has a lot of upfront cost relative to what that insurance price might be. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's probably the challenge that a producer is going to face, especially those that are having to borrow a lot of operating capital is justifying to the bank how, with that insurance price at a 65% coverage level and how much they have to pay to put it in the ground, uh, whether or not those banks are going to finance it. Yeah. Go on. It's definitely a challenge. Interest rates. Yep. Talk a little bit about cotton's kind of getting hit right now from two different perspectives at the same time. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Which I'm sure makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Right. Uh, explain that and mm -hmm. how that's impacting competition from some other uh, other markets. Yeah. So, you know, Interest rates do hit us from two sides when we're, when we're producing. On one side is the obvious, right? It's the, the cost of production, the borrowed capital, and, and what I have to pay the bank in order to uh, continue to operate. And so, you know, I, we, we were looking at 2022, 2023 numbers at a rise of about 2% in the interest rates, about a penny a pound. Um, you know, that's that's not huge, but it's not inconsequential either. A penny a pound can make a difference. It adds, it, up, it, it, it adds up pretty quick. Yeah. And so I think, you know, from that side is the obvious side, but it's probably the least important side. The more important side really is the fact that uh, with the rise in interest rates, you see a rise in the U.S. dollar. And as the U.S. dollar rises, it makes U.S. commodities less competitive internationally. Right. So it puts pressure on those internet on those prices, um, you know, for export sales, things like that. We've seen that this fall, uh, you know, where we're 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 behind USDA's numbers in terms of exports. Um, you know, they're they're soft uh, week over week at, at this point. And so, yeah, you know, I think we're seeing some of that. And, and that's in part because that's being replaced by more competitive growths like out of Brazil, right. uh, where their currency is a little more um, soft. And so they um, are a little more cost competitive. But, uh, yeah, the, those two are working against each other, uh, you know, us, you know, with us in the middle, um, you know, at the same time, which I think is uh you know, it's a, it's a bit challenging for people to understand why that's occurring simultaneously, but it's all through that interest rate U.S. dollar relationship. Right. And we've got another, a lot of other moving parts out there, too. Like, you know, global stocks are sitting at a pretty decent level right, right now, and you've got demand that is, you know, soft, mm -hmm. to be kind. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> on it. And all of that's going to have an impact as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the, the big thing we see, you know, that we've seen this build up in stocks, um, and really what I think we have is this back channel effect where, um, you know, the, the, the retail firms were ordering fewer units mm -hmm. that was backing up in terms of fabric stocks, which then were backing up into yarn stocks, which now the yarn spinners are not buying as much cotton. So we're backing up into cotton right. stocks. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, that that's seeing that stock level rise is is a pretty strong indication that overall demand is is down and not only is it down it's weak going forward with the expectations because that spinner is going to buy that cotton and get that yarn spun mm -hmm. in order to be able to respond to demand up upstream so um yeah we're we're weak at this point um and a lot of that is because of factors around the world yeah uh talk about acres a little bit and you mentioned just a minute ago that the commodity relationships and the, right. and the ratios particularly corn cotton and looking at how cotton compares to corn right, right. now, and even even soybeans mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, 
I think US, USDA is, is saying right now, what? 11, 10.9, I think. Yeah, 10.9 to 11 million acres based yeah. on that formula. Right. Uh, is that, uh, seems like a challenging number. It, it's a challenging number. Right? And, and, you know, part of it is the production cost estimate uh, elements that we talked about before in the sense that even though the ratio favors more cotton acres this year than it did last year, the production cost elements favor reductions like in urea and others favor the corn over the cotton in terms of profitability. Mm -hmm. So even though, even though the price ratio may favor, favor cotton a little more this year than it did last year, the, the, uh, the production cost numbers don't. Um, so, you, you know, you, you've got to adjust down a little bit for that. The other side of that is that soybeans is one of the few things <laughs> that actually looks you know, good. Yeah. Um, and so uh, those soybean acres, you know, added soybean acres um, are are going to, you know, sort of infiltrate the south, southeast in particular, and probably rob some acres from cotton sure. where we expect to see. So I just, you know, I don't think we're going to, you know, it's going to be tough to get to that 10-9 um, that USDA is currently forecasting. And uh, I, we, we just... You know, I, I I would say, you know, in my mind, anywhere from 9.8 to like 10.3, depending on some weather factors, you know, moisture, where soybean prices are, things like that. But I, I it just, I cannot see us at, at, at 10.8, where we are today. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about geopolitical issues mm -hmm. uh, right now that are the kind of the uncontrollables. Right. But, right. but they also have an impact yes. on it. You know, the global economies are down, not just in the U.S., but... You know, yep. China and other other countries. We've got still a potential for conflict. Yes, out there. Uh, you know, obviously demand down. Where do you see some of that stuff settling, and what what are you hoping is it going to happen? <laughs> Maybe we should put it. Yeah, that's right. a better question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, of course we we've had the Ukraine conflict for a good bit of time. We saw the you know the the blip that occurred in grain markets and and fertilizer markets, things like that. That sort of sorted itself out, and and we're back to <laughs> traditionally low wheat prices. Um, so they, it's terrible to be a wheat farmer, uh, but. You know, that was sort of sorted itself out. The Middle East conflict in Israel, as long as it remains contained um, to where it's at, uh, and, and I think outside of Iran, most people are happy with just letting it contain itself in in Israel. Um, you know, as long as that, that, you might expect, you know, you might expect impacts on oil markets or something like that in terms of expectation, but nothing huge unless it just breaks, you know, spills out. The one that keeps me up at night is China, right? And so a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is just, you know, it's an unmitigated disaster. And, um, you know, because you you would ultimately have the two largest economies in the world essentially facing off over a little right. island, right? And we saw through COVID what happens when the Chinese supply chains get disrupted. Um, and so, you know, that would definitely disrupt supply chains. Uh, and so I think that one's probably the one that keeps me up at night. The other part of that is also China is, you know, they're not doing particularly good right. economically. And, you know, when you look at the official numbers, they look bad, which means that unofficially they're, they're worse. They're worse. Um, and so, uh, you know, that that's a cause for concern in terms of um, sort of where the time path, how long that time path is before you see sort of a global recovery of, of coming along. I mean, you know, the U.S. is doing OK. Um, you know, we're not great, but but we're doing OK. So the largest economy on the planet is doing OK. The second largest economy on the planet's is not. Um, so the longer that persists, the longer the drag is on the global economy in terms of, of getting back to some sort of reasonable time path uh, or, or demand path uh, for, for cotton. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, persistence and, and dragging things out, we have a farm bill extension. Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the last times we talked, you were getting ready to get on a plane to head to D.C., yeah. uh, you know, to kind of, you know, shake things up. Right, yeah. And, you know, and, and get things moving. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where are we standing right now? As, as of, what is this, December 9th? Yes, December 9th, uh, it, absolutely no movement whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, there's not a huge impetus, I think, to move it forward um they have an extension so they you know they're, they're the pressure's off right um yeah lots of distractions some of it circus like um you know this like we've discussed the speaker of the house event the you know the, all the stuff that's going on now we're 
you know, talking about Biden impeachment hearings and, you know, all this other stuff. How many distractions can we throw? Yeah, how many distractions can we throw in there? And, you know, the bipartisan relationship that normally exists on the House Ag Committee, which has not disappeared, but it becomes more strained mm -hmm. the more of these circus events that go on. Now, you know, the, the only thing that will speed them up is trying to avoid getting into the, the heat of the election um, and, and try to get that done. So, you know, it could pop in, um, you know, at any minute. I think one of the biggest issues is floor time, uh, you know, getting getting the floor time. I, I don't think Chairman Thompson believes he's going to get the floor time. So why bother, you know, with a huge markup and going yeah. through that whole process? Uh, at the end of the day, I don't know how much of this will actually change. I mean, I think the, the argument is going to be over what are those PLC price levels and then what is the impact on the cost of the farm bill, Right. Um, which was my last visit to D.C. Uh, and and so I think, um, you, you know, there, there's a bit of a internal, and it's not even internal because the CBO is independent, but there's a battle between, that, you know, the committees and, and CBO about what the appropriate forecasted prices are for these commodities so i think that's that's where we're at as we're still working through some of that mechanics i don't think the structure of the farm bill is going to look that much different you know i think at the end of the day we're talking about tweaking elements of the farm right yeah so you know it should be a relatively quick you know markup moving forward as long as people are in agreement with what those price levels are going to be and that sort of thing so you know I, they could get to it pretty quick uh if if there was a window of opportunity of getting it, you know, getting it through the keyhole, they they probably could. But um, it's just waiting for whatever that chance is. Yeah, they they instead of kicking the can all the way down the road, they're just kind of yeah, they're just they're, they're just nudging it. Right? Yeah, they're just nudging it exactly. <laughs> uh, short term and long term confidence in the economy right now. We mm. uh, talk about I think you were talking about giving some advice in terms of from what, what should a grower do? Yeah, in terms of his marketing and and. Separating marketing and risk. Yeah, I got, I kind of explained that a little bit. Well, you know, we, we uh, and and this is in part um, the fault of my profession is we we call everything to do with futures and options and contracts all that marketing, mm -hmm. and it is. I mean, in fairness, it is. But I think from a business manager standpoint, you know what what we need is a frame of mind where we have risk management versus revenue maximization right so on the one side i want to protect my business i want to make sure that i've got the downside price risk or i've got the insurance i've got you know whatever those strategies are that 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 producer is attempting to do but the purpose of those is not to make money the purpose of those is to protect the business right. then separating that out and having their marketing strategies where they're trying to maximize that revenue and so the example i used in the talk was let's say i throw all my cotton in the pool you know, I'm in staple cotton or PCCA or whatever, and I throw it in the pool, you know, and so, you know, a lot of times producers are concerned, well, if I throw it in the pool, but I'm going to miss all the upside potential on, on the market, well, go buy a call, right? And, and you know, put your, if you're comfortable with your, your cotton being in the pool, put it in the pool and then go go buy a call. And then that way you can capture that upside or at least some of that upside potential <clears throat> while having most of your downside price risk uh, covered. So strategies like that of trying to think about it, but but it's kind of like, you know, I think it, um, it's it's almost like you have your fun money when you go to the casino, right? And you say, okay, I'm 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 willing to lose this amount of money. That's my marketing side. I mean, that's the stuff that I want to do. I don't want to commit my life savings when I go to the casino. Right. I want to protect my assets, mm -hmm. so I don't put everything on the table. Uh, you know, I, I I keep keep stuff back. So the same thing with the farming. I think we just really need to think about risk management and then marketing. Um, and, and both of those are very valuable and, and, and producers need to think about them. They just need to think about them independently mm -hmm. so that they're making the right decision for managing the risk and then the right decisions for trying to maximize. Yeah, I've, I've always told people that farmers are the greatest gamblers in the oh, world. Absolutely. But I've never made, never made the analogy in my head between between farming and casinos. Yes, yeah. You know, well, I... It, like we did, we could put some neon signs along the farm roads. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, we did a few projects when, uh, at, when I was at Mississippi State at uh, at Tunica, at Tunica and yeah. had, had some farmers come in. And one of the, you know, we were doing some, um, you know, some acreage elicitations, risk perceptions, things like that. Well, one of the things I asked them, I said, where are they going to go gamble at the casino? 
And, you know, most of them said yes. And then I asked them how much were they willing to lose? And one guy said like 20 grand. And I'm like, he's on a whole different level of, of income than I am because that, that was a lot. But, but yes, I, uh, farmers are notoriously, um, they're both optimistic and pessimistic at the same, same time, time. Yes. Um, which, which would indicate schizophrenia um, to most psychiatrists, but, but they're farmers. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the sort of that perpetual optimism <clears throat> that they have sometimes can get them in trouble too. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's not about, it's just think about the risk management differently than you do mm-hmm. the the gambling if you will the the trying to beat the market right um and i it, you know and i i think there's lots of producers that are very good at it but if you put all those eggs in one basket and you lose out you know you don't want to be in a position where oh now i got to roll debt for because i didn't get my crop paid for you know whatever right. so uh that's that's really it you know just just be be a pessimist and be that you know uh, it was George Will who once said, the nice thing about being a pessimist is you're either always right or pleasantly surprised. <laughs> That's sort of like being an economist or a meteorologist. Oh, yes, right? Exactly. Exactly. You're very, very similar. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you've got some wiggle room in there to, be, you know, to, you know, if things don't, don't work out the way you say. Exactly. Or you can blame the meteorologist. I, I blame the meteorologist all the time. That's what I <laughs> Absolutely. Darren, thanks. I appreciate the time uh, for the visit. Uh, It seems like the only thing that we can say right now is uh, for certain is that uh, the market is going to remain uncertain. Yes, absolutely. Every day. Yep. (laughs) Good. I appreciate it. Have a good Christmas. You too. And uh, and, uh, catch your breath a little bit. Yep. And we'll uh, we'll meet up again in Fort Worth here in January and and start it all over. Start it all over again. We'll see how bad we were wrong for the last three weeks. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely. Thanks a lot. Right, Appreciate thanks. it. All right. Well, that's going to be it for this episode of the Cotton Companion Podcast. Big thanks to Dr. Darren Hudson for joining us today. And uh, we also want to thank, of course, the American Cotton Shippers Association for their participation and sponsorship of the Cotton Companion. Those folks at AXA got a big year coming up, 100-year anniversary. So nice, nice year coming up for AXA. Uh, and as always, we want to thank you, dear listener, for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and if you've liked what you've heard, please be sure and spread the word. Tell your farming buddies about the Cotton Companion podcast. Here's how and where they can find us. You can find the Cotton Companion in three easy ways. First, go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion, or simply click the podcast tab at the top of the homepage. Second, subscribe to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts these days. And three, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, The Cotton Grower E-News, that's delivered to your email inbox every Tuesday morning. You can do that by going to cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe. Also, be sure to follow Cotton Grower on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you'll find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. Cotton Companion Podcast is produced twice monthly by Tyler Hatch and Kim Henderson, our talented colleagues at the World Headquarters for Meister Media Worldwide in lovely Willoughby, Ohio. I'm Jim Stedman. He's Beck Barnes. And we'll be back with you in a few weeks to begin another year of the Cotton Companion. Until then, we hope everyone has an enjoyable Christmas and a very happy New Year. Yeah, it works and it works and it works and it works all day. God made it for me. Yeah, it works and it works and it works and it works and it works all day. God made it for me. Yeah, God bless.